YouTube and Facebook, where you can also visit hgse.me backslash ednow for recorded episodes and information on our fall webinars. We are restarting again in the fall. Um, I am Rick Weisbord. I'm the co-director. I'm a faculty member here. I'm the co-director of our human development and psychology program. And I'm also the faculty director of the Making Caring Common Project, which puts caring for others, which seeks to put caring for others in a commitment to justice front and center in child raising. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us. We're delighted to have you. Um, you can submit questions throughout the webinar today using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom. We really wanna hear your questions. I know our panelists really wanna hear your questions. So I hope you will let us know what's on your mind you will also find closed caption access there as well. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a, a, a quick shout out to all the teachers out there who have been doing hard work for a long time. This pandemic's been going on for a long time and are hanging in there and are still doing great work. And um, to the parents out there and to the students out there, um, I know that things are tough and, um, you, and you've really been hanging in there and you've been inspiring and I really appreciate you and cheer for you. And I think I can speak for all of us in saying we really appreciate and admire and are cheering for, for you. I am delighted to welcome our guest. Um, Karen Mapp is a, a colleague here, a friend, I'm a longtime collaborator. She is the faculty director of um, our education policy uh, I'm sorry, Education Policy and Management Master's Program. I got to know Karen when she was the Deputy, Deputy Superintendent of Schools in Boston for Family and Community Engagement. She has um, lots of experience um, as an academic, but also in policy and in practice. And she's a terrific thinker on this subject. Sarah Friedman is the co-founder of the Learning Community in Central Falls, Rhode Island, and was the co-director of the learning community for, for 17 years. Also someone with a great deal of practice experience. And Svate, Svate Lelybeld is an eighth grade social studies teacher at the Bronx of Young Leaders in New York. And we are, I am thrilled to have all three of you um, here today. And I hope you will all join me in welcoming them. So thank you and hi to everyone. And Karen, I'm going to start with you. And I want to ask you just to tell us what healthy school family partnership means. You've talked about family engagement as something that the whole school, even the whole district has to be committed to. And I'm wondering if you can sort of paint a picture for us of what that looks like. Well, thank you, Rick. And I'm really happy to be here today with such a distinguished group of people. And I want to say that, you know, when we talk about uh, homeschool partnerships or family engagement, what we really mean is that there's a culture that exists in either the school or the district or even the classroom where families are really embraced as full, equal, and equitable partners. I like to use the term co-creators or co-producers in, um, in the cultivation of uh, excellent uh, educational opportunities for all of our students cradle to career. And so I think that this idea of seeing families as full equal partners with us is something that sometimes we say, but um, in my work and uh, for many years with districts, a little bit harder to actually uh, do that work. And I think we're gonna have some examples here today in Sarah's work and Swati's work about what that really looks like and what that really means. It's a mindset. It's seeing families not through a deficit lens, but through an asset-based lens where they are really seen as knowledge builders. Um, one of our colleagues, Shante Tool, talks about families as the most important brain builder for their child. And I think that if we see all of our families through that lens, then we're gonna create a culture in the school where homeschool partnerships are actually the foundation for everything else. And so, um, that would be how I would describe what we really mean by uh, partnership, powerful partnerships with families. Okay, great. Thank you. That's that's true. That's that's very helpful. Let me ask you a question about. So, what do you think? What, what's getting in the way? What are the barriers here to this kind of co-creation? You know, I talk to teachers and sometimes say, you know, I'd love to do it, but I don't have the time. Um, 
I don't know if there are, you know, biases that are getting the way that you're worried about. I've, I've heard from teachers who say, parents aren't educators, so we, we don't really need, you know, we should leave this up to educate. Anyway, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about this. Well, I've been doing this work for a long time now, and I used to think that the barrier was that our practitioners had not received adequate training. And I do think that that is a big part of it, that we're expecting teachers and principals and others to go in and sort of do family engagement, but they've never been trained. And when they haven't been trained, unfortunately, there's this you know force that pulls them in to do ineffective practice. But I do think there's something else there that serves as a barrier and you named it and that's our biases. I, I do find that a lot of times we have been really influenced by, you know, Beverly Tatum talks about the smog that we breathe in of, in her case, she talks about racism, but the other isms also we breathe those in. And then even those of us who are well-intentioned, who really think that we are, you know, we've gotten over uh, these kinds of biases, those biases shape our practice. And so if we don't really examine how we feel about families, do we see them as less than, you know, I hear things in schools about, well, you know, Dr. Mapp, our families don't speak English, our families are poor, our families, I hear all this deficit language. And that deficit mindset shapes your practice. Yeah. So if, if you see your families as less than, you know, and I've heard even more troublesome descriptions. Uh, I've heard people say, oh, they're on the dole. You know, they don't, they don't value education. Uh, they don't care about education. Can you help us get our families to value education? I've, I've heard this one. Right. Too, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and, and I have to be honest, I've been doing this work for a long time. I've never met a parent or a family member that doesn't value education yeah. and doesn't want to do right by their kids. Uh, there may be circumstances, as you well know, Rick, in your work that keep our families from being able to do that, but their desire is for their children to do well. So I, we've got to work on both training, but that training actually has to include an opportunity for us to interrogate our biases about our families. Yeah, yeah. Very well said. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I'd love to uh, pull, pull you into this. I don't know if you have any thoughts about what Karen said. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. And I, but I think it, what Karen said is related to the question I wanted to ask you too, which is that, you know, we know I, you know, I do a lot of relationship work, healthy relationships are built on trust. And um, how, how do you think about building trust? And how do you think about building trust now too? And we're in the circumstances we're in. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rick. I love that question and I'm gonna answer it in a second, but first I have to thank the families and kids and team of the learning community and also Dr. Karen Mapp and the brilliant members of cohort 11 of the EDLD program because I'm standing on their shoulders right now. And for people who know me, I'm pretty short on my own. So, <laughs> um, I, um, so actually the way I think about building trust really builds right on what um, Dr. Mapp was just sharing. In my school, we build trust with families, first of all, by naming that families are not the problem in education, that families, in fact, are the moral compass in education. No one has higher expectations for their children than families do, not just parents, but all the caregivers who are helping to raise a child. Um, and in my experience, families, kids, and educators in low-income communities are blamed for racist and classist system failure because people with power and wealth want to preserve it. And so we start from a place with our families of naming that the system is broken, not the people. Um, and I'm going to use a metaphor and my friends in C11 will appreciate this um, because I use a lot of metaphors. The, I was on my road bike yesterday and not working very hard at it, but I passed a woman who was pedaling 10 times harder than me on like her, you know, mountain bike. And I think the metaphor is that in my experience, families in low income communities, they're constantly told pedal faster, pedal harder, don't give up, you can do it, have more grit, you know, also have a good attitude about it. But the reality is that the race is rigged and they don't have the bike. They just don't have the bike, right? They, we need to focus on fixing the system. 
Um, and as a school, when we build trust with our families, we have to name that outright. And then once we name it, if we're in true community with our families, meaning um, if you're okay, I'm okay. And if you're not okay, I'm not okay. Then we have to step up to that reality and say, right, okay, the thing is broken. The whole system's not fair. So now as a school, we're, what are we gonna do about it? And in the case of our school, what we try to do is leverage and transfer all the power and resources that we have to our families as quickly as possible based on what they tell them is really happening with them. Um, and, and so I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, and you know, in the last spring in COVID, we had families who were, um, many families, who had to continue working outside the home to survive. So they're in factory jobs, they're cleaning offices, they're cleaning hospitals, they're working in you know, uh, medical professions. They're being told that if they don't show up for work that they're gonna be replaced. They're not being provided the PPE they need. Um, we had families with landlords who were threatening to kick them out, maybe didn't have um, documentation status, but they paid their rent. Um, they're ignoring the, the cancellation of eviction notices that the governor's putting out. So as a school, we can't turn around now and say to the families, um, we're not going to help you with all that, but can you teach your kid math now all of a sudden, right? So we have to step towards that and say, all right, that's also our work um, to, to figure out together. Um, and so I think what we've been doing is like trying to support our families in just celebrating and being grateful for what they are doing with their kids, which is remarkable under these circumstances, that they are able to be loving and reassuring. We had a family this spring, both parents were sick with COVID. They called us um, to ask advice because they had a fourth grader and they were trying to teach her from under the closed bedroom door so they wouldn't infect the kid but they're getting the texts from the school. They're trying to understand what we're asking. And then they're trying to like give the, this fourth grader instruction from under their door and still be like loving and reassuring to their kid who's obviously gonna be anxious, right? And so that is like, like the people in my community cannot work any harder. They cannot pedal any faster. They, they need the wind at their backs, you know? So I think schools to build trust has to play the role of saying like, how do we advocate for accessible like COVID testing? How do we make sure that families who don't qualify for federal assistance because of immigration status have the money and the food they need to survive through this period of time? Um, how do we advocate with the AG's office to punish landlords and business owners who are taking advantage of low-income families right now um, and make sure that they have their rights protected? Um, and then above all, I think like, everyone at the learning community team feels like it's an insane and amazing privilege that our families have given us to share this stretch of childhood with these beautiful, beautiful children. And so we are gonna bring all of the expertise we have to try to figure out how we love and support those kids through this time and help them learn what they need to learn um, through this time without making families feel on their own responsible for the learning loss that is a necessary and unfortunate repercussion of a global pandemic, which is beyond all of our control. So, so that's, my, that's my answer on trust. Right. It's, a, it's a wonderful answer and thank you. So, so let me just ask you a question about this and it would, you know, it would help to just know more specifically when you, when you talk about, and Karen talked about this too, about asset-based, an, an asset lens or a strength-based lens with families. What does that look like on the ground? I mean, what are the, some of the mm -hmm. things that you're doing or encouraging educators to do in the ways they engage families? That's, thanks for that question. I think, um, well, we have, since our first year, we start the year, the, our relationship with families with something we call welcoming meetings. And um, in those meetings, um, Previously, before I was in the EDLD program, I would meet with each new, new family um, and come from a place of just saying, like, for starters, just share with me every, every, like, amazing thing you want me to know about your child and you want us as a school to know, right? Like, just brag about your kid, just love all over them with me, let me, tell me all their funny quirks, right? And um, 
So that is being carried on now. All of our teachers at the learning community are doing welcoming meetings with the families that they're going to be working with. Um, and I think that is a starting place for any family to feel known um, and also to feel like I'm entrusting my child with you, right? And, and it's also a way of finding out the family's point of, of like um, connection, like where, what is the relationship like for that in that family, right? And so then that's always a place of, of beautiful strength that we build from. Um, and then, you know, I think we ask, we have a million systems for asking families for feedback at the learning community. And so we uh, intentionally don't have a PTO. We've avoided representative democracy because I saw it in other school systems turn rapidly into clicks for families where like a few families have a big voice with the administration and the rest of the families feel less included. Um, and so we developed something called parent cafes where um, that happen like twice a month, the families generate the topics. They're differentiated by grade level. Um, and a lot of it starts out with feedback from the families. And so kind of building this sense of culture among the families that like, I'm gonna stand up and ask you what's not working and it's gonna be okay. You're gonna tell me what that is. I'm gonna write it down on a big flip chart or a piece of paper, whatever. We're gonna go back as a team and figure out how to make it better. And we might come back with 10 questions, but we're gonna fix that thing. And the school, and that's how we built the whole school. Like, um, so families feedback is constant, um, both on like every, every interaction, but also macro scale. Um, and I think that builds a culture where families feel like their strengths matter, like what their, their ideas matter, right? Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. No, that, that's, that's super helpful. Thank you. And I Baki. just want to jump in, Rick, and just say okay. quickly, I've been to the learning community and spent the day there. And I have to tell you, again, I've been doing this work for a long time, but that it was just the, the family the families are in the bones of the school. It's like they're in the DNA of the school from the moment the school opens till it closes. You don't go for more than a minute or two without seeing families' presence, whether it's spiritual, physical, it's just in the place. It was just <laughs> absolutely amazing and astounding and it made me hopeful, you know, because a lot of people think this stuff we're talking about today is aspirational that it's not real, that it can't be done. And uh, to be there and to see it full tilt, I have to tell you was an inspiration to me. Thank you for saying that. Wonderful to hear. Svati, thank you for being so so patient. I realize that you all have so much to say that, um, and we don't have that much time. So Svati, I'd, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, you can certainly respond to anything you've heard so far, but I'm also, very interested that you know that you were on the ground this spring when schools closed, and what happened? How did you remain connected with students? How did you may remain connected with students that you might have been struggling or that you had concerns about? Um, before I answer that question, I want to piggyback on a previous question about engaging families. Um, I think one thing that all teachers can do um, with their families um, that they're working with is encourage metacognitive thinking. So um, asking their students whether or not the parents have the math skills to teach multiplication, um, but asking their students, um, what do you need to know to be able to do this? Um, what's going to be easy about this task? What's going to be difficult about that task? Um, also, families can foster a growth mindset by praising a student's efforts, um, not just their final quiz score, but the strategies that they've used and um, the study skills that they've used. Um, to try to, um, to tackle their tasks. Um, but the last day for the question that you asked, the last day of school was actually Friday, March 13th. Um, interestingly enough, it was a half day of school and um, we were scheduled to have parent-teacher conferences and the city had already canceled the parent-teacher conferences but hadn't yet canceled school. Um, my friends working in corporate jobs or in charter schools, um, they had already been working home from home for a week. Um, so. Uh, we were in the public schools knowing that something was looming, but not really knowing what was going to happen. And then over the weekend, we heard from the mayor that uh, schools were closed. We weren't going in on Monday. Um, so the following day, that Tuesday, um, all the teachers were asked to report. 
And uh, I'm a member of the instructional learning team at my school. Um, so I represent the social studies department and we uh, meet with our principal and assistant principals. And um, we had to really put our, our minds together and try to figure out um, how are we going to start remote learning? Because um, not every classroom, I had never used technology in my classroom um, other than the smart board that I used to project my lessons. Um, I had prided myself on not having my students sit in front of screens when they're in front of me. Um, but that ended up uh, kind of being a disadvantage. Fortunately, um, my, um, the math teachers at my school were using a program um, really just for diagnostics, but at least through that, the students were already connected um, you know, to this online um, space where they could all find each other and the teachers could find them. And also the English teachers in my school, actually the eighth grade English teacher in my school um, was using Google Classroom from the beginning because she was pretty tech savvy. So, um, so then the next day that the teachers reported, um, we had like a, just a really quick le uh, lesson, a professional development on how to use Google Classroom. Um, I had never used Google Classroom before. Fortunately, I had used um, Power, you know, the presentations and the docs and the forms, you know, that we use to give quizzes. Um, but I set up my Google Classroom then and there. And then we had a week to call all of the students. So I actually just used my cell phone. I called 110 of my eighth graders. Um, for many of them, I would estimate about 50 of them. I had to call multiple numbers to be able to get in touch with them. Um, and then as the, as time progressed, my school was able to sort of streamline it. So then I was only calling my homeroom students. Um, so it wasn't 110 students, it was 27 students. Um, and from then, um, I would say for the next two months, the biggest part of my job was just calling students and their families on the phone um, and trying to help them connect online. A lot of students um, didn't have adequate technology. Um, so we were just really staying in touch through their parents' cell phones. Thank you very much. It's 3.22, so I want to make sure that we get to some of the audience questions. And there's some, there are some great questions in the chat box. Um, one of them, I think, is, you know, for any of you, it's a big one um, that uh, for any of you to take up. And that's the question of the work of, of helping educators overcome their biases about families. And what does that work look like? And what are some of the strategies that you might use if you're a principal or a fellow teacher in thinking about that. Um, Svati or Karen or Sarah, anybody, any of you want to start? Um, I'd like to jump in. Um, when I first started teaching, um, I, it was obvious to my students and to their parents that I was not a parent, that I was too young to have kids um, who were in eighth grade. Um, and it, you know, it did take me a little while to, uh, to build up that trust, um, to say, yes, I am young. Um, I've, I've never raised a middle school child, but I'm still here to help. And I think one thing that is really important is um, just using our empathy, you know, um, listening to parents. You know, when, when I call a parent, the, the first thing I ask is, how are you doing? And I listen to them and I praise them for the resilience. I let them know that I realize that if they're expressing that they're in a difficult situation, that I can also imagine that's difficult, whether or not I myself have ever been in that situation. Um, and another thing that I think is uh, really important is when you're speaking to a parent about their child is to lead with something positive. Um, and if a parent does have a child who um, sort of has a track record for getting in trouble or misbehaving in school, it often can really um, disarm them if you say, you know, your student is, is really outspoken. They have really amazing leadership skills. And that's just a total conversation changer. Terrific example. Karen, you want to speak to this or Sarah? Yeah, I, I want I was going to jump in and just say this that, you know, I've actually scanned a lot of the questions that are in the in the Q&A. And I do think that what we have to fundamentally do is to, we have to change our practice around including families in the conversations about what to do. So there's a lot of questions in here about, well, what do I do if this happens? Or how do I start relationships with families? Or you know, some of our families, um, uh, we think we're hearing that they're discouraging their children from looking at higher education. What you need to do is to start having, whether you call them parent cafes or you include family, you have to ask families, what do they think about X? And then have them co-create the solutions with you. You will never come up with the right answer 
if it's just going to be a round table of practitioners trying to answer these questions. You just won't. So the more you can, um, and I think a lot of this has to do with our fear about sharing power, uh, and we can have a whole conversation about that, but where I see the schools overcome a lot of the things, the challenges that are listed in the Q&A is when they realize that the families are there to be co-creators. And we do, by the way, when we say families, we mean all adult caretakers. So we are talking about grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle. But, you know, sit down, ask your families that they'd like to be included in these conversations. And I'm talking about that they're on the decision-making teams, not that you're just going to pick their brains in a focus group. They are on the decision-making teams. If you do that, then you're gonna make progress on any of the questions that you have in, your in, in the Q&A. I think also um, including as many parents as possible in school leadership teams. Um, that's also another strategy just in the structure of a school that can help a lot. Mm -hmm. I could give a couple of concrete examples what Karen's talking about briefly. Um, we had so we have um, professional development time set aside to focus on our work with families every year. And for the last five years, we co-created and co-led that whole day of professional development with families. And, and the focus was families really drove it. And I just supported them in figuring out the structures, but it was like training the team, training all of us as a team to listen carefully to families. Um, and so it was like, a, it's, yeah, anyway, so there's many ways I could explain more about that. We also spent um, the last four years, we brought in outside folks um, with expertise around race and racism, especially given the, the um, disproportionate number of white team members on our team compared to the student and family population. Um, to, and, and we decided as leaders to bring in outside folks because we also wanted to examine we wanted help being really open and examining institutional practices within the school that maybe we as leaders were, um, you know, um, creating conditions um, and and not living up to our mission of being an anti-racist organization. So, I, and that was very intentional adult learning work that had to happen. So I think you know all that has to happen at the same time. All right, thank you all. Um, another question. Um, that all of you may have thoughts on. Um, it's how do you, uh, what are the district level policies and initiatives that can create the conditions for the culture shift that you're describing? Well, I think as a former deputy soup, um, one of the things that I, I do always ask superintendents right now to examine is, you know, if we are going to create a culture where families are seen as co-creators, right, where they are fully embraced as um, the geniuses that they are uh, about their children, about their community, what do we need to change in terms of our practice and policies? So I think one, one example that a teacher said to me was, you know, at my school, our policy is to have parent-teacher conferences where I only meet five minutes with every family and I do all the talking. Um, or, you know, uh, during COVID, the phone calls that I was making home were all about checking up on my families to see if they were turning in at the time of the class, the classroom session. Uh, the Boston Teachers Union, in fact, has started a wonderful program where they do they train teachers on how to listen to families and to and to empathize with them and to meet them where they're at around what's happening during COVID. And so I, I think it, it may seem like small shifts. I do think that again, going back to the mindset, are we if we can examine our practices to see whether they're coming from a deficit place versus an asset place, I think you start to see change and transformation. I don't know if the team has, I, I sent a link. There's a teacher um, in New York, uh, in Corona, New York. I'll try to remember her name, uh, Christina Armas, that talks about how now that she sees families as co-creators and co-teachers, she's changed her practice in her classroom and she's never going back. She doesn't ever wanna go back to the way things were before. So I just think that, you know, we, we, we have to start examining again, what's, what's standing in the way of us really embracing families as co-creators 
And maybe sometimes it's smart. It starts with those small things. Sarah talked about not having a PTO and having parent cafes. Look at your practices around phone calls home. Look at your practices around, you know, who gets engaged in decision making at your school. So again, keep that co-creation mindset at the forefront and interrogate all your policies and practices. Um, very helpful. Sarah or Svati, do you want to weigh in on this? And I guess, you know, one way to frame this is, and uh, is to think about what are the district policies that, you know, in your experience have been disabling um, and, you know, challenging uh, and what are the kinds that have been enabling and really enabled you to do the, the kind of co-creation that Karen is, is talking about? Um, one thing that has been a big challenge in my experience is the flow of information. Um, so for example, um, in, in the spring, in the end of May, the chancellor made an announcement that um, students would not be held back, students would not be forced, mandated to go to summer school. Um, and, you know, we, we heard that on the news, um, just as the parents heard it on the news. And it was like, oh gosh, now how are we going to motivate anybody to get their work done? Um, so I think that if, there, if we could adjust the flow of information so that um, schools, the principals, the admin, the educators um, were aware of these decisions and we can kind of accommodate for them rather than students informing us, oh, well, I'm not gonna go to summer school anyway, so I don't need to worry about this assignment. Um, so that's one thing is the flow of information. One thing that's been um, very helpful um, at the district level is hosting really frequent uh, Zoom meetings among parents. Um, at my school, it's the, the parent liaison, the parent coordinator who does it. And she hosts them every week, even through the summer. Um, and parents come and weigh in sometimes about, you know, academic concerns and sometimes just about their own COVID related concerns, sometimes related to finances, sometimes related to um, other aspects of their health and safety. And I think it really helps to create community and build trust. Thank you. I am. Um, so I think, I think of the district rule as um, for families as making sure that there's fairness, like the systems are fair, um, that people's rights are protected, um, every family's rights and child, um, that, and that families have access to their children and their children's teachers. And so one example of that is just examining like is in every front office of every school in a district, is there somebody who speaks the languages of the families of that, of, of the kids in that school? Because every family should be able to feel like I can pick up the phone and talk to somebody who, who will understand what I'm saying if I need to convey information related to my child or I need information, right? That's just a basic safety as a parent thing. Um, and then the last thing I will say is I think that families can help set district policy around outcomes for kids because families have the highest expectations of anyone for their kids. And so districts often set outcomes um, and states often even set outcomes at test scores, for example. But if you really talk to pretty much any parent, what they want for their kids goes far beyond that and has to do with having like really solid friendships and being really known by their teachers and being able to pursue their passions and their interests and feeling really safe in school and feeling like um, they can be themselves and they can bust their own weird moves and, and things like that. And so families, that that's an expectation that's higher than test scores, right? And so I think if districts listened more at the front end to families, we'd be setting our targets higher than where we are now. Um, and that would be good for kids. Thank you. Um, thank you all. I know that we have takeaways and we're a little, we're already a little bit over time. So I was going to ask um, Peter if you could share the takeaways. Uh, and these are takeaways that our terrific panelists have, have distilled for us. Um, first one, own up to the deficit mindset Educators often care about families and interrogate your core beliefs about them. Do you see families through a deficit or an asset-based lens? And Karen, thank you for underscoring this, lifting this up for us. Number two, take a hard look at your current and proposed family engagement practices. Ask yourself, does this policy practice celebrate families as co-creators and co-producers of quality educational outcomes? If not, 
reimagine the policy practice and change it. Meet, meet families where they are and offer solidarity. Ask them how they're doing, listen to them, praise them for their resilience. Parents can support students beyond typical homework assistance, encourage parents to praise students' efforts and to ask students about prerequisite skills, supplies, and study habits. Okay, I know that we have to um, wind this down. I really want to give my deep appreciation and thanks to the panelists. Um, I've learned a lot. My guess is the audience have learned a lot. And I'm just really encouraged and inspired and heartened that you all are out there doing this work. Um, so I, I, I am cheering for you. I want to just to also tell everybody, sorry, I got to do this. Make sure to vote in this election and make sure to tell your friends and everybody you know to vote. It's a critical election for our country. And I also just wanna say to everybody, to all our audience, be well and take care and make sure to tune in the fall to the next sessions of Education Now.